Philippians 2. So if there's any encouragement, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you, not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a, a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Good morning. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, we hope to cover this morning um, verses uh, possibly nine uh, through or nine through uh, four, uh, thirteen, but most likely it will be uh, verses uh, nine through eleven. And I know Dennis; he likes to read more than less, so uh, we're glad he read the entire passage. Um, it, it's it's good to know where we've been. Uh, where we are now and then where we're going. Um, but by way of review, um, he, uh, Paul begins a letter with, if there be these things in Christ. Um, we titled that message uh, verses uh, 1 through 4, or 1 through, uh, through uh, yeah, 1 through, uh, 1 through 3. Um, there is, there is, there is, there is, because Paul asks four questions, uh, if, if, or, or makes some statements. <clears throat> if there is any encouragement in Christ, uh, and then we would say, well, there is. Uh, if there's any comfort from love, uh, we would say, well, there is. Uh, if there's any participation or fellowship in the Spirit, we would say there is. Uh, and if there's any affection and sympathy, uh, in Christ, uh, and we would, of course, say there is. There is, there is, there is, there is. Uh, and when we answer those questions, when we say, well, yeah, there is, there is, there is, there is, uh, Paul very uh, deftly, uh, uh, very uh, cleanly and nicely, he puts us in a corner. He puts us in a corner. And basically he's saying, well, then if there are these things in Christ, if in your life, uh, being born again, if you find encouragement in Christ, uh, if you find comfort from love in Christ, if, if you have fellowship with the Spirit because you're in Christ, and if you have affection and sympathy because you're in Christ, well then, well then. And he goes on, he says, complete my joy by being of the same mind. So if there are these things in Christ, if there are these things we enjoy in Christ as his people, then we should have the same mind. We as a church of God should have the same mind. We at uh, a local body at BBC, we should have the same mind. Uh, we should have the same love. Uh, we should be of, uh, in full accord. Uh, and of one mind. 
these things should be here. Uh, that's not to say, as we've said before, there can be uh, different of opinions on some matters, but uh, we should be able to come together and, and work these things out. Because we have the same mind. We want there to be peace. We want there to be unity. Uh, we want there to be peace and hu uh, unity, so we want there to be the same love. And uh, we need to be in full accord uh, 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 in Christ and of one mind. These things should be in us. These should be our goals. These should be our desires. A healthy church will have these in place. He goes on to say, do nothing, do nothing from self-ambition. Uh, and, and I can say that selfish ambition is one of the most unseemly and unsightly things in a church. Um, there should be nothing done from conceit. There should be nothing done uh, except to be with humility, counting one another better than yourselves. And, and brothers and sisters, this is where uh, faith comes in play. Um, Paul will say later on in chapter 4, verses 1, he says, Entreat Yodia and uh, I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companions, help these women to, uh, to, uh, who have also labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So there is very possible that differences and disagreements can come up. There was something going on between these two ladies. There was something going on between these two sisters. And it was something that was known, known in the church. It was something that was known to Paul. And Paul desires there to be this peace, this unity, this desire of oneness. Uh, between these two ladies, and he uses them as examples. And that has been in, the, that's been in all churches. Um, there's been cases in this church as well. Um, but this is where faith is seen. I was talking with one member, uh, and we were talking that uh, if a house burns down, if our house, bur not, not the church, but our, our, our individual home, if it burns down, we're going to say, well, I know God will see me through this. Uh, when you see hurricanes or you see uh, tornadoes uh, r r run through a town uh, and the news uh, interviews these people, you'll find some of them saying, well, but I escaped with my life. I know God will see me through this. And you see, you see faith. You see people honoring God. You see people's love for God. You see people's submissions to God. And they'll say, this is... This is according to God's providence. I don't get it. I don't understand it. But I know it's God's providence because all things fall under God's providence. And this is a beautiful example of faith. And people look and they say, how could they think this way? And people are, are, are surprised by this. But let somebody be walking out of the church door and when somebody walk in front of them, and that is absolutely the end of the world. That is the end of the world. Because nobody else saw it. Nobody else saw it. I can hold that, res I can hold that resentment. Or someone looks at you the wrong way. Or someone puts up Christmas lights. Or they're not taken down in time. These things ruin your day. Or, or, someone cuts you off in traffic. And seeing how you don't have a Christian fish on the back, you can show your anger. These are where our faith should be in play. This is where our faith should be in play. This is where we fail so often in our faith. Instead of saying, well, you know, there's comfort in Christ, there's encouragement in Christ, I have participation in the Spirit, and I have affection and sympathy that's Christ-like. I can let those things go. Or, 
or if it's something that, for whatever reason, it just, it just stays with me. Well, then I know from the Word of God I can go and I can say, sister, I can say, brother. Uh, I know you didn't mean to step in front of me, uh, but for whatever reason, it's bothering me. And they'll say, well, when did I do that? Well, what are you talking about? And there can be forgiveness. Oh, I, I don't remember doing it. I sure didn't mean it, but I'm sorry. And then we can go on. Um, but I can say this, if you're one of those people that that kind of stuff gets to you, there's, a, there's a, a much bigger problem. There's a much bigger problem than someone cutting you off in traffic, uh, in, in the center aisle, in the aisles. Uh, there's something else going on. Uh, but we as God's people should be able to work on these things. We have the Word of God. We have the Spirit of God. We have the, uh, the, uh, the example of Jesus Christ. We have the commands of God. And in these things uh, is our faith shown or in these things is our faith denied. So if, there, if, we, if we enjoy these things in Christ, Paul then again puts us in the corner and says, well then, do these things. And don't do those things. And then what does he do? What does he, do? he gives the example of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who was in the form of God, who the second person of the Trinity, the Word of God. Uh, he was Alpha and Omega, beginning and end, first and last. Uh, the second person of the Trinity. Uh, he holds everything, all power, all glory. He sits at a throne. He's, he, he's regaled by, by angels and seraphim, and they're crying, holy, holy, holy. And they're, uh, they're saying that you are... You are strength, you are wisdom, you are glory, you are power, you are righteous. And he leaves that. He doesn't hold tight to that. He gives that up. He empties himself. He sets those things aside. And he takes the form of a servant. When did he do that? When he was being born in the likeness of men. And we said this repeatedly. Elsewhere it says in the likeness of sinful men. Uh, not sinful, but in the likeness. He was found in the form, in a human form, and he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the very point of death, even the death on a cross. And when he says even the death on the cross, uh, that, 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 that emphasizes his death. In Deuteronomy, it says plainly, that person who dies on a tree that person who hangs on a tree is cursed, is cursed. It, 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 it's, it, it's a place for a lowly criminal. It's a place for the worst of the criminals to hang on a cross. And he hung between two thieves, two malefactors, both mocking him, as well as the people on the ground mocking him, from the chief priests to Pharisees, uh, down, down, down just to the average person walking past, wagging their heads, mocking him. At that point, he's been spit on, his beard has been pulled out, he's had a crown of thorns put on his head, hit with a reed, forcing it in. Uh, he had a, a purple robe put on him, over all the, the, the marks and the, 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 the scarring, the, the clotting of blood. And they, they mock him as king, and then they tear that off. And they put his old robe on, and they lead him out. And Pilate says, behold the man. And he says, I can free him, or I can, I can free him, or I can free a criminal. And they say, free the criminals, because we are criminals. And we don't like the light. And so they crucify the Son of God. The sinless Son of God is hanged on a tree. And the whole point of this is to say, be like him. Be like him. And how can any born-again child of God walk away from something like this and not be changed? So often, so often in, in churches or uh, radio program, Christian radio programs or even discussions. Uh, we say things, we hear things, 
Uh, we walk away from things and then we forget things. That ought not be the case. We ought to hear what's being said. We ought to uh, read closely what's being read. Uh, the song that's being sang. And then we should take time to think on these things. We should take time to meditate. Uh, Dennis read from Psalm 119 that we should meditate on these things. These things should take hold of us. They should be real. They should magnify our faith. That when we come across somebody who has who wronged us truly or in our own imagination, we should say, wait a second. Wait a second. Christ, hang, he, he was hung to a cross. He was humbled, or he humbled himself. He took upon this form of a servant. When he was reviled, he didn't revile again. When he was slapped, he gave his other cheek. Uh, when he stood before, as we said last week, a buffoon of a king who wanted to see a magic trick, he sat, stood silently, silently as king. Because, you see, he's the judge. He's the judge being judged by man. Sinful, buffoonish, puny, wicked, unrighteous, unsympathetic sinners who have no encouragement in Christ, no comfort from love, no participation, and no affection, and certainly no sympathy. But that ought not to be us. That ought not to be us. We should love one another above ourselves. Uh, what is that old, the old uh, joy? Uh, joy, Jesus, others, and then you. Uh, that's faith. Uh, that's what we can do when we take these things to heart. Uh, we can do those things when we pray and say, Lord, those things are lacking in me, but I don't want them to lack. Or, or on a good day, when you let an offense go and you say, well, you know what? Christ would turn the other cheek. Christ would have me do unto them as I would have them do unto me. And, and I would want them to give me the benefit of a doubt. So I'm going to extend the benefit of the doubt. The love believeth all things. I'm going to do that. And then we turn and we say, thank you, God. Thank you, Spirit, that you enabled me to do this. Uh, I hear it from your word. I hear it in discussion. I hear it in song. And thank you, God, I can do that. Uh, so that's where we're, that's where we're, uh, that's what we've looked at the last few weeks. Um, now we pick up in verse number 9. And because, because Christ has humbled himself, even to the death on a cross, because of that, because of what Christ has done, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him that name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus Every knee should bow, whether this be in heaven, on the earth, or under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To what end? To the glory of God the Father. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for the hope in your word. We thank you for the instruction in your word. Uh, Father, we ask that our faith would be formed to that, to that which we hear. Uh, we ask that you would extend grace to us, that we might ext ext uh, extend grace to others, that you would ext extend comfort and peace and, and affection and sympathy to us, that we might extend that to others. Uh, we thank you that you humbled yourself. We're thankful that you did not grasp to your sovereign right over all things, but you laid that aside. Father, you, you came in the form of, uh, in the likeness of men, in, in human form, uh, in the form of a servant, and you went to a cross. That cross was our cross. You died in our stead because of our sin. Uh, none of this was because of you. None of this. But there you, there you hung. There you were mocked, you were belittled, you were mistreated, you were beaten. Uh, but because of that, because of that, we hear that God the Father 
will highly and has highly exalted you, giving you a name that is above every name, and at that precious name every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. And we thank you for this hope which is in Christ. Amen. Now we've heard this passage before. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess uh, that Jesus is Lord. And this will be done to the glory, to the pleasing of, of God the Father. God the Father is not jealous when his son is exalted. God wanted his son exalted. God uh, let sin, God let sin enter into this world, cause the fall of mankind, cause man to fall into sin, uh, to be in Adam, to, to uh, earn death, a human death, spiritual death, eternal death. God allowed all of that. God decreed all of that. God ordained all of that. Why? So that Christ might be exalted. You might say, well, I thought he did that, that my sins may be forgiven. Well, that's true. But your sins have been forgiven to the pleasure of God the Father. You say, well, I thought it was so I might go to heaven. That is because of Christ, and that pleases God the Father. The glory of God is the purpose for all things. The glory of God is the end of all things. You hear people who think they're smart, who say, well, what is the purpose of man? What is my purpose? They get philosophical. And the answer is basically found, uh, is a number one question, a number one answer in most catechisms. It's simple to the Christian. It's simple to one who was born again. It's simple to one who reads the Word of God and who is in fellowship with other believers. The answer is simple. Man lives to glorify God and to enjoy God. This is the chief end of man. This is the chief purpose of man. And that is done through the exaltation, the exaltation of the Son. We see this passage is, is uh, three different places. Uh, you can find it first in Isaiah 45, uh, verses 22 and 23. And that is in the context of salvation. It is a context of salvation. Uh, you find it secondly in Romans 14, verses 10 through 12. And there it is used in the context of Humility, humility. And then we, uh, third, we find it in our text, Philippians 2, 9 and 11, and that is in the context of victory, 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 the victory of the Son, the defeat, the defeat of all that is at enmity with God. It is in the context of victory. So in this passage, we find salvation. In this passage, we find humility. In this passage, we find exaltation. Uh, we had made mention, I think, two weeks ago, that what we see in these passages, in 2 through the, uh, uh, 11, what we see in these passages uh, dealing with Christ, uh, we also will see that they... They mirror what is our destiny. They mirror what is our destiny. It is we are destined, we are destined to be saved. We are destined to find everything in Christ. We are destined to humility. And we are destined to exaltation. What does God do to the proud? He abases the proud. What does God do with the humble? Uh, he exalts the humble. And that is our, that is, that is, what, what, is what is seen in chapter 2 of Philippians is our mirror. Uh, Paul says elsewhere, I think it was Paul, he says, those who will 
suffer with Christ. Those who will suffer with Christ will also reign with Christ. In chapter 1, in chapter 1 of, of Philippians, uh, we, to, we read that, that it has not been given to us to believe only. Uh, and if you believe today, it has been given to you. Uh, you have been given faith. You have been given repentance. You have been given salvation. Uh, it was, it's by faith that you've been saved. And that faith is not of yourselves, but that faith is the gift of God. So that no man should boast. That all men should be humbled uh, before he who saves them and who is now uh, reigning Lord over their lives. What we see in chapter 2 of Christ is also true of all that are born, have been and will be born again. And this gives us great hope. But we look today at, at the Lordship, the Lordship of Christ. And as we ended last week, we just made brief mention on this subject, the subject of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And I would hope, I would hope, that everyone here who is born, have been, has been born again, anybody here that has been saved and has been humbled, looks to Christ as Lord. Anybody who is born again, who has been saved, should look to Christ without doubt and call him Lord. I hope you're saying, well, that's obvious. That only makes perfect sense. But that is not true for all. There are many who call themselves saved believers, um, but would deny, would outright deny the lordship of Jesus Christ. That is something that should, should just make your mind just blow. You should say, are you kidding? Who are these people? Well, some are church members. Uh, some are church saved, but not born again. Some are preacher saved, but not born again. Some who have been prayer saved, but not born again. They don't like the idea of the Lordship of Christ. Because that implies complete submission and obedience. And they don't like this. Uh, some of these people stand behind pulpits. I've had a three-hour conversation on a Wednesday. Uh, probably 20 years ago. I sat at a pastor's table. A man who uh, resigned... His pastor, after 20 years, and he sat there and for three hours argued with me against the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Three hours. And he never changed his mind. If you asked him today, he would argue against it. Now, he's not saying that he, should, he shouldn't be your Lord, but what he is saying is this. If a person wants to be saved, that person does not first need to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. He will say, from the pulpit, he will say, every Sunday, 52 Sundays for 20 years, and will say, you can receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. And you'll read about it in books. They'll talk about Jesus the Savior. When he's offered, it's Jesus the Savior. It's receive him as your Savior. But no mention of Christ as your Lord. When you look in Scripture and you see those two things put together, it's Lord and Savior. Lord and Savior. Our Savior and our God, Jesus Christ. Who was it that was born that we celebrate on the 25th? Who was that that they would find in the stables? Who was that? Christ the Lord. Christ the Lord. 
When people have come to your door and they have knocked, and they say, do you know for sure if you're going to heaven? And they try to then give you a plastic, practiced spiel. They will ask you to call upon the name of the Lord. But they don't mean it. They don't mean it. They separate the lordship from his saviorhood. And you can't do that. Scripture doesn't allow it. In fact, it disallows it. We said a few weeks back that not one place that I can think of, and I've looked at this, and I don't think I've missed anything, you will not find his disciples, when they're talking with him, when they're addressing him, you will not find a disciple of Jesus Christ calling him Jesus. I don't think you'll find it. In fact, I'm pretty sure. I'm saying that because I don't want one to slip past me. <laughs> they don't. They call him Lord. They call him Master. In fact, he even says, you call me Lord and Master, and in doing so, uh, and in doing that, you, you're doing very, very well. He even says, you do well to call me Lord. In Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Acts chapter 2, in verse number 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain. Let there be no doubt. Let there be no confusion that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you sacrificed. When they use Jesus, just it, it, when they're talking about him, oftentimes that Jesus is a, is a reference to his humanity. But they present him as Lord and Christ. Christ and the ESV, Christ and leader. Christ demands that we submit to his lordship in all things. We're told that he is Lord of all. We're told that he is Lord of the living and the dead. The living Christian, the dead Christian. In fact, I would make the argument, I would make this argument, that the reason people are in a, a, a lost people are in their sinful state is because of this. They will not submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ. They will not do it. They cannot do it. Neither indeed can they. But we who have been born again, we are to submit to him as Lord. It is our privilege, our privilege, to call him Lord. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12 and 3, no man, no man can call him Lord, except it be by the power and in the power of the Holy Spirit. It is our privilege to call him our Lord, yet we don't, we don't find it to be so. It can even make people who are in the church discomfortable. I've seen people, when I talk about this, they cannot bring themselves to say, Lord Jesus. And that's concerning. That is very concerning. God has exalted him, making him Lord. In Christ. In Acts chapter 5, well, we, I mentioned that earlier, he calls him Christ and leader. Christ and leader. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit that we have the privilege, the right, and the ability to address him and to submit to him as the Lord. In fact, I would make this argument salvation is nothing more 
than a sinner bowing his knee to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, we call it all kinds of different things, asking him into your heart. When I was a nine-year-old kid, they said, do you want to go to hell? And I said, no. They said, well, then you need to ask Jesus into your heart. And I said, okay. They take me out into the hall. We get on our knees. They said, do you want to pray or just want to repeat it after me? And I said, I'll repeat it after you. And I asked Jesus into my heart as a nine-year-old boy. It didn't change anything. Um, I didn't go to church. I didn't change anything. I mean, I've, I've always had a high view of God for some reason. Uh, but it was not according to knowledge. It was not according to knowledge. Uh, so we'll say, ask him into your heart. Uh, we'll say, you know, say this prayer, this decision. We call them decisions and choices and prayers. But salvation is nothing if not if not a submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It is nothing more than we who were at enmity with Christ, loving the world, resisting in rebellion righteousness. All in rebellion, we resist righteousness. Salvation is nothing more than taking the sword we have used against God, laying it down, and submitting my life, your life, to Christ Jesus. How did man fall? By not obeying, by not submitting to the rightful place of God. And that's true today. Sinners will remain lost. Sinners will have no hope but absolute hopelessness for all eternity. Why? It's because they haven't bowed the knee to Jesus Christ. Because they did not bow the knee to Jesus Christ. Now, in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21, uh, we find people coming up to him. And we talked about this in Sunday school. Um, coming up to, uh, to Christ and saying, Lord, Lord. They say it twice. Because what they're hoping is, if they haven't fooled him with the first Lord, they'll fool him with the second Lord. And what does he reply to these people? What does he reply to the people that say, Lord, 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 I hope he buys the second one, Lord. What does he say? I never, never knew you. I never knew you. They did not bow the knee to Christ. They simply addressed him. They didn't mean it. We know in Matthew 25 that these people will go and say, well, we did this, we did this, we did this, we did this, we did that, we did those things, we did these things over here. Well, what did he say ultimately? Depart from me. The everlasting fire. So here, 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 Here's the ironic point in this. Sinners, unsaved sinners, will call him Lord two times when we who are born again rarely call him Lord once. Now we're told every knee will bow and every tongue will, will confess that he's Lord. If we're to do that in his presence, should we not do that as we're absent from him? If we're going to do it anyway, should we not do it now? Paul, at the close of his life, in Acts chapter 28, towards the end, verse 31, it closes... Uh, Acts closes. All that we know about Paul, aside from tradition, it closes by saying this. Paul, at the end of his life, was proclaiming the kingdom of God that is a sovereign rule 
the sovereign reign of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Christ Jesus came preaching what at the beginning? What did he come preaching? He came preaching the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is at hand. He is the kingdom of God. He is the sovereignty of God, the power to rule and reign, the absolute authority of God incarnate. And how is that displayed? How does he display, how does he show this this power, this rule, this reign? How does he do it? He does it in kindness, in healing, giving sight to the blind, giving hearing to the deaf. Those who have not seen, now they see that Jesus Christ is Lord. They who are deaf now hear that Jesus Christ is Lord. Peter, in 2 Peter, there's, there's three chapters. In three chapters, 14 times, he addresses Christ Jesus as Lord. Lord, 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 Lord. Lord and Lord. I don't know if there's 14. I might have counted chapter and verse. First Corinthians opens and closes with the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Second Corinthians opens and closes with the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 2 Timothy, Philemon, and 2 Peter. They open and they close with the Lordship of, seven, uh, Lordship of Jesus Christ. In the book of Acts, Christ is mentioned as Savior twice. Two times in Acts, he's referred to as Savior. In that same book, he is addressed as Lord. Lordship is a tribute to him. The call for submission is, is, is cried out 92 times. 90 more times. Let me be clear. Let me be clear. If you are lost today, if you have not yet been born again, if you realize that you have no hope, I make this clear statement. Christ will not save those except they bow their knee to his lordship. I hope that's not a radical statement here. I pray to God that that is not received as a radical statement. If you will not submit to his lordship, he will not save you. Who is it? Who is it that the Word of God says? To whom is it referencing? When, it's, when it says, if you call upon whom? The Lord. Call upon the name of the Lord. If you confess what, you will be saved. What is it we are required to confess in the presence of God? The Lordship of Jesus Christ. These are passages that we have used in evangelism for probably as many years as we've been, as we've been saved. We say, call upon the name of the Lord. If you will confess the name of the Lord... But we don't mean it unless we understand it. That preacher would preach from the pulpit 52 times for 20 years. Call upon the name of the Lord. Call upon the name of the Lord. Call upon the name of the Lord. If you confess him as Lord from your heart, you can be saved. 
If you speak the Lordship of Christ from your heart, you can be saved. And then for three hours, for three hours and 20 years, he denied that one must submit to Christ as their Lord. Not only does he speak that blasphemy, he goes so far as to say this. How many, how many, you can raise your hand if you want to, you don't have to, but how many of us thought we were saved, but then realized later that we hadn't been saved because now we have been saved? Anybody ever experienced that? I, I, some of you have told me you did. I thought I was saved. I thought I was. I said the sinner's prayer. I went to the front. I, I, I did this. I, I went to church. I, I heard a pastor's daughter stand up in front of that church and say, for 25 years, I thought I was saved. And I wasn't. You know, how do I know that? Because I am now. There have been pastors. There have been pastors who have been saved in the pulpit at their own preaching. They went to school. They got the degree. They got all these things. And all of those things are fine. But they were lost. They were a lost man preaching to lost people and some who have been born again. That's astounding. But when you bring this up to one who denies the Lordship of Jesus Christ, who denies the requirement of submission to Jesus Christ for salvation, when they deny this, when you, or when you bring this to them, you say, well, what about these people who thought they were saved but realized they weren't saved because they have truly been saved? What about those people? He'll say this, straight-faced. Well, they've just decided to make him the Lord of their life. That person standing there saying, I was not saved. But now I've been born again. Their life didn't change. Now their life is different. They went to church and got nothing. Now they go to church and get everything. They read the Bible, didn't get it. Now they get it. They've been born again by the Spirit of God. And what does this preacher say? Nope, they've always been saved. They've just now decided to make him the Lord of his life. You cannot make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. You can't. He is Lord. You don't make him anything. It is your responsibility to submit to this Lordship. And I will give you three Logical reasons to do that. They're logical, but if God is in it, they will become very spiritual to you. But they're very simple. These are three reasons that if you're lost today, you should today submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Receive Him as your Savior. Because He holds in His hand the very breath of your life. In his hand, he holds the very breath of your life. You can't lengthen it. You can't shorten it. He holds it in his hand. That's a very good reason to submit to his lordship. Number two, not only does he have your very life in his hand, but he has the power not only to kill, he has the power to cast you into hell. Third reason you should submit to Christ's lordship here and now, he is the only way. So simple, so simple. He could kill you today. He could kill you tomorrow. He can kill you 50 years from now. 
One woman just died at the age of 115 this week, the last week. 115. And they said, what is the secret to your life, long life? She said, hard work. That's not the secret. That is not the secret. Eating well is not the secret. Not doing this is not the secret. The secret is this. God holds your breath in his hand. He has given you a stated time to live. And some people live a very long time. For what purpose? For what purpose? That they may repent. That they may repent. What is repentance? We say, well, it's a changing of the mind. And it is. But what is repentance? How is it seen? Repentance is seen through a bowed knee. Repentance is a turning from going this way, turning from, the, turning from this way, turning to this way, and bowing at the feet of Jesus Christ. Throwing your sword aside, bowing on your knees, bowing prostrate on your face. And confessing Christ to be your Lord and receiving him as your Savior. Now it says at the, at the, at the, at the name of Jesus. Now, this is difficult. Because it's very plain. It says at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Uh, but one commentator, he brings up and he asks to this. Is it a two-syllable word that we bow down to? Just Lord, or Jesus, Jesus, or for some of us, Jesus. But it's two syllables either way. But there have been many. There have been many named Jesus. Sometimes it's pronounced Jesus. There's been many people in the Bible, outside the Bible, in different cultures. Named Jesus, named Jesus, Joshua, Jason. Uh, uh, there's a third one. Uh, Joshua, Jason. Uh, yeah, no, there's three of them. Those are the two I can remember. Uh, but is it, is it that name? I think it's a combination of language. It's just telling us that at the dignity, at the dignity, at the supremacy, at the rule, at the reign of God's Son, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Now let me say this, and this, I know, this was, I'm studying this, and this was something that was new to me in my studies. Uh, when this is used, Old Testament, New Testament. It seems to be speaking about born-again people. I mentioned in Isaiah 45, it's talking about salvation. Born-again people. In Romans 14, born-again people hum uh, uh, humbling themselves at, at the feet of Christ. Philippians 2, 9-11 is talking about uh, the, the, the exaltation, the exaltation of Christ. But it seems to be speaking mainly to those who have been born again, those who have been saved, those who in life have submitted to him as Lord and received him as Savior. You got to do both. You got to do both. So I'm not going to say it's not at the name of Jesus, but there's so much more in that name. There's so much more in that name. That name to some of us means everything. We love to hear that voice or that sound. We love to hear the voice of others saying a two-syllable word. We love to sing about it. We love to hear it. We love to hear honor, power, majesty ascribed to the blessed name. But not only is it dignity, it is it is, it is sovereignty. It is complete, total authority. 
In fact, in Revelation 3 and 12, it speaks of those who call him Lord, who confess him as Lord. We will be set up in the kingdom, uh, uh, in the kingdom as pillars, as pillars. We will have a prominence and a stability. Those of us who are conquerors or are overcomers in the name of Christ. In 1960, he is called King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In Revelation 19 and 12, it says he has a name that no one else knows. In Revelation 22, and I believe 3, it it makes, it indicates that he himself Christ himself will be given a new name that nobody knows but himself. And it goes on to say that those of us who love Christ, that new name, that new name, along with the name of God, Jehovah, as well as the name of the new city, will be stamped upon us. Speaking of ownership, and that new name, that new name that will cause everybody to bow, will be inscribed on our forehead. It's at the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Most creeds, most confessions, most catechisms, they all speak to what is called the session of Christ. That's a theological term. The session, the session of Christ. And what does that mean? It's what is called Christ taking his place at the right hand of the Father, at the right hand of authority. At the right hand of God does Christ sit, waiting for the day that he will come for his people who in this life will submit to him, to his lordship, to his authority, to his power, to his rule, to his reign. We will give all our rights up to Christ. This is what a normal, born-again child of God does. Uh, There have been books written um, on this very subject of the Lordship of Christ, of ascribing his title to him. I think it's important to ascribe lordship to Christ. I think it's important that we think of him as our Lord. And when we speak to him, we address him in his title. This isn't legalistic. He commends his people for doing it. He commands his people to do it. If we do not look at Christ Jesus as our Lord, we are not in right relation with him. Every knee will do it. Every tongue will do it. Now I said this is typically applied in these, the three passages I shared, Isaiah 45, Romans 14, Philippians 2. It looks like it, it, it's, it's speaking more towards God's people. That's not to say, that is not to say that sinners will not bow to Christ. They don't mean it. If they do, it will be forced. Now we're told in Revelation that sinners who are cast away into hell, and then uh, at one point hell's delivered up, death is delivered up, and they're cast into a lake of fire, a lake that burneth with fire, brimstone, 
You can't breathe. You gag. You're in outer darkness. You think you're alone, but you hear the screams of others. It's a fire that burns with blackness. Wormwood. It's a horrible place. And it says of these people that they still will not repent. They still will not repent. This is folly. This is folly. This is absolute foolishness. If someone breaks into your home and puts a gun in your face and says, get on your knees, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You're going to get on your knees. Most of you get on your knees. If someone comes and breaks your glass car window and says, get out, I'm taking your car, you'll probably get out. Why? Because they hold power over you. They hold your life, humanly speaking, in their hands. It would only make sense to do what they say. My friends, Christ Jesus holds your life in his hand. He has power to cast you into hell. And he is the only way, the only hope, the only truth that can keep you from that. He said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says, no man can come to him except the Father draw him in sovereign love, drag him forcibly. And what do we do when we come to Christ who has our life in his hand, his power over hell? What do we do? We bow down. I invite you to do that today. Today in our life, we bow down to responsibility. We do things because we have to. We have to bow down to law, to government. We bow down to our fear. We bow down to public per- perception. We maybe bow down to peers. We bow to sin. but not to him who has power over it all. These things don't make sense. They don't make sense. I will end there. I don't, I don't want to move into uh, working out your own salvation, but uh, God willing, uh, we will look at next week that uh, it's not difficult. It's not a difficult uh, passage or, or clause of a passage to work through. Um, but it's work out your own salvation. Work out your own salvation. Uh, in what way? With fear and trembling. Uh, so we hope to look at that next week. We will look at, again, God willing, we will look at uh, two, two different views. One is unscriptural, one is scriptural. Um, oftentimes people will talk about, um, they'll use the term once saved, always saved. Um, and truly, a, a, a person who has been born again will remain saved. If God has set his love, if God has set his electing love on you, you will persevere to the end. There's no doubt. There's absolutely no doubt. But to say uh, to a room possibly mixed with unbelievers who know it, unbelievers who think they're saved, uh, it's not right to say to these people, once saved, always saved. Because they're looking at their lives as saved. There's nothing in their lives. They made a, they made a prayer years ago, there's no, there's no fruit. There's no evidence in their lives. But the preacher said they were saved. And once they're saved, 
as the preacher goes on to wrongly say, they are forever saved. Now, I challenge you to walk up to that person and tell them differently. I challenge you. Go up to that. Go to a person that believes they're saved. And there's no fruit, there's no evidence, there's nothing. Never has been. Never has been. But they've been told repeatedly, once saved, always saved. Once saved, always saved. Once saved, always saved. And you tell them different. It's not going to go over well. For years they've heard that. And now you're coming along and saying something differently? That's why it's dangerous. That's why it's so dangerous. The Bible speaks of the perseverance of the saint. Or what I like, to, I like is, is the preservation of the preservation of the saint. God's preservation of that saint. So we'll look at those two different mindsets. But again, if you're born again, you cannot lose your salvation. No man can take you out of the hands of the Father. Uh, that which God has decreed and ordained and brought to pass cannot be undecreed, unordained, or changed. If Christ died for you, you will endure until the end. No doubt, no exception. If you submit to Christ as your Lord and have received him as your Savior, you will persevere. You will be preserved. But in these teachings, Paul uses some language that is challenging. But we'll look at that, God willing, next week. We'll look at what it is to uh, work out our own salvation in a state of fear and trembling. So God willing, pray for that, and uh, we'll, look, we'll look for that. Um, we met with a, a, uh, uh, a possible interim pastor. Um, what is an interim pastor? He's not a, he's not a full-time pastor. Uh, he probably won't be. I've, I've, seen, I've, seen that, I've seen interims become pastors, full-time pastors, um, but uh, I, I don't think there's any intent uh, for that on, on, on his part. Um, he was a uh, seemingly a very meek, humble man. Um, he reminded me of a cross between uh, two people, um, and I say that respectfully, I say that with love. Um, a very calming, very calming uh, personality. Um, I found him to be impressive. The deacons found him to be impressive. Um, and I believe, uh, is Gabe here? No, Gabe's not here. Um, I believe there, uh, there's plans for Gabe, possibly myself, to uh, go up and meet uh, this gentleman this week. Um, in Carol's stream, Gabe works out there. The interim, possible interim, lives there, uh, so we might go out there and kind of talk more about uh, like compensation and things of that sort. Um, now, that's not to say he, 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 he. We'll talk to you about all this stuff. We'll give you names and everything. Um, I, I, I just don't want to do that right now. Um, but, but the deacon, the, the, the uh, deacons, and the. Um, Pulpit committee, we are working. Um, we, we met a number of times. We're coming up with kind of a profile of what we're looking for. Um, we all make our, our different kind of arguments on, on what we think is, is proper and the right balance. Um, but we are working, and we trust that we should have something worked out, I would say, within the next... Uh, couple weeks. There are other, there are other uh, uh, responsibilities he'll take on as well, but that's not here nor there yet. Um, so just keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your providence. We thank you uh, for your unchallenged rule and reign. Oh, I ascribe all power and majesty uh, all might unto you, O King. Uh, you are our King. You are a King above every King. You are a Lord above every Lord. And to you we bow our knees. 
to you we, we lay prostrate, holding your feet, submitting to you, because your ways are right, your ways are true. Let us hold to these things, and we thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming and securing the Father's will. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming and, and applying uh, the will of the Father and the security uh, uh, made possible by the Lord Jesus and, and applying those things to us and, and Lord, inspiring, inspiring the word and giving it life to us and, and helping us to understand what we read. We thank you so much for your presence and your rule in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.